I have hit Zoom. I mean, I, <laughs> I have hit go live. I did not hit Zoom. I typed in Zoom so that I could go log into Zoom so that I could then share my screen. And hello, we're live. Tea and new book. <laughs> oh, today's going to be a day, you guys. <laughs> but I can't even say the name of the live stream. We're going to have a day. Hello and welcome to Tea and New Book Tuesday. I'm Lisa. I'll be your librarian today. <laughs> One of my coworkers told me that her favorite part of this program was watching me mispronounce names. <laughs> and uh, like a couple of weeks ago, I was in Arizona with visiting a family friend with my mother. And uh, we got a karaoke mis machine and we're singing and my mom was deliberately singing the wrong lyrics which was funnier than it sounds and I just was watching this and thinking this is this is really kind of charming this is why everyone thinks it's charming when I do things wrong I thought it was because I was a know-it-all and I think it's in fact just a weird skill I've inherited from my mother I don't know. I'm rambling, but let's get into the program. Uh, don't know what any of that was about. <laughs> oh, all right. Today, we are going to talk about January science fiction, fantasy, and horror. All of these books are already pre ordered by Mobile Public Library. Many will arrive, or sorry, I should say, many have already arrived, but they will be released if possible, to be checked out on their release date. <laughs> you understand this. Most of you have seen this, so maybe I shouldn't bother explaining it because I'm not making a whole lot of sense. I swear to God, I've had like that much caffeine and then chamomile tea. I had sugar, but I always have sugar. I have lots of sugar. Um, I did have like real chocolate. I can't long story that I'm going to make as short as humanly possible. I can't eat dairy, um, but it's not a severe problem. It's just a sort of, mm, I'm going to have problems in a couple of days. So I'm pretty good 90% of the time, but it's Christmas and it's really hard to behave on Christmas. It's like trying to diet, especially this week. This week, I'm just like, whatever. It's, it's, the library is going to be closed Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I'm going to be at home opening presents and enjoying my family. And I have like a day and a half more work left, but I just, how much I can make myself do is a question. How did I get off on this tangent? What am I even talking about? I was trying to tell you something. This happens all the time. Oh man. I wish you guys could respond because I'm sure you're all just like, you were, you were talking about this. You're talking about not getting things done. Um, so anyway, let's go ahead and, well, first of all, not first of all, but in addition to all of the other rambles, I am going to let you know who won best book of 2021, both fiction and nonfiction here in a minute, as promised. I saw that many of you voted, that was awesome. We got a decent number of votes overall. But first, we have to do your favorite part of Tea and New Book Tuesday and mine, which is the giveaway. If you watch last week, you'll already know the new shebang, the new way we have to do this, since Facebook is being Facebook about things and has started messing with the comments. So instead, I'm gonna have, I have a link in the description and I'll put it in the comments as well after the video is done. But the link will take you here. It lets you give me contact information, what MPL location you want for pickup, and then you get to choose from the four books for this week. You can choose up to one. I will pull a winner tomorrow, Wednesday at around noon. Uh, I also have all of these leftover books. So if you want any of those, let me know. Um, a lot of people picked the same books last time. So that ended up being a drawing situation as well. But 
At any rate, that's how you win these books. And then once you send it to me, I'll have your response because that's how responses work. And, uh, and I'll send out books starting tomorrow afternoon, literally afternoon. Um, bear in mind, some of it might get there if you're picking up at a location other than Maine. Some stuff might make it on Wednesday, but I think it's way more likely to expect to be able to pick them up on Monday or Tuesday of next week, just because that's sort of how our transit is working right now. Uh, am I still sharing? I don't need to share. I've shown you the screen. Get out of there. Okay, so let's talk about this week's giveaway books. First up, we have A Spindle Splintered by Alex E. Harrow. This is a modern retelling of Sleeping Beauty, I think. And not a terribly long book. It looks interesting. Sleeping Beauty. Wait. Okay, so this is their description from the back. USA Today bestselling author Alex E. Harrow brings her patented charm to a new version of a classic story, splicing the threads of the Sleeping Beauty stories. Sleeping Beauty is the worst fairy tale, pretty much any way you slice it. It's aimless, amoral, and chauvinistic as S. Even among the other nerds who measured in folk folklore, Sleeping Beauty is nobody's favorite. The romantic girls like Beauty and the Beast, vanilla girls like Cinderella, goth girls like Snow White, only the dying girls like Sleeping Beauty. So that's as much of a description as we're getting out of them, that one. This came out in October. Next, we have a nonfiction option. Walking the Bull, a true story of murder and survival among the street children in Lusaka, Lusaka by Chris Lockhart and Daniel Muelio Chana. This is based on years of investigative reporting and unprecedented field work. Walking the Bull immerses readers in the daily lives of four unforgettable characters. Lasabillo, a determined waste picker. Capula, a burned out brothel worker. Munga, a former rock crusher turned beggar, and Timo, an ambitious gang leader. These children navigate the violent and poverty-stricken underworld of Lusaka, one of Africa's fastest growing cities. When the dead body of a 10-year-old boy is discovered under a heap of garbage in Lusaka's largest landfill, a murder investigation quickly hits up due to the influence of the victim's mother and her far-reaching political connections. The children's lives become more closely intertwined as each child engages in a desperate bid for survival against forces they could never have imagined. Gripping and fast-paced, the book exposes the perilous aspects of street life through the eyes of the children who survive, endure, and dream there. And what emerges is an ultimately hopeful story about human kindness and how one small good deed passed on to others can make a difference in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds. So that's Walking the Bowl, the sole nonfiction. It's been added. This is a different color cover than the one that I've used on the giveaway form. And that's because it, this, is, this was uh, sent out before they had settled on a cover, but it's Dare to Know by James Kennedy. So this is fiction. Our narrator is the most talented employee at Dare to Know, a prestigious company in the death prediction business. But when he has mastered the art of death, the rest of his life is an abject failure. On the day we meet him, he is shaken by a near accident and decides to violate the cardinal rule of his business by forecasting his own death day. The problem? Apparently he died 23 minutes ago. I think we discussed this one when it was coming out, which was back in September. Some unknown date in the past September, I think. Uh, but it looked interesting there. It looked interesting back then. So that's Dare to Know by James Kennedy. And this is the sole pre-release. This comes out January 4th and is on a bunch of lists of books people are really anticipating in 2022. It's The School for Good Mothers by What do we think? Jasmine? Jessamine? Jessamine. Jessamine Chan. Okay. Oh, it's all quotes. I hate it when they do that. Okay, so here we go. 
Frida Liu is struggling. She doesn't have a career worthy of her Chinese immigrant parents and sacrifice. She can persuade her husband, Gus, to give up his wellness obsessed younger mistress. Only with Harabic, Harriet, their cherubic, cheri, cher, cherubic daughter, does Frida finally attain the perfection expected of her. Harriet may be all she has, but she is just enough. Until Frida has a very bad day. The state has its eyes on mothers like Frida, the ones who check their phones, letting their children get injured on playgrounds. Who let their children walk home? Because of one moment of poor judgment, a host of government officials will now determine if Frida is a candidate for a big brother-like institution that measures the success or failure of a mother's devotion. Faced with the possibility of losing Harriet, Frida must prove that a bad mother can be redeemed, that she can learn to be good. A searing page turner, the School for Good Mothers introduce, introduces in Frida and every woman for the ages, using dark wit to explore the pains and joys of the deepest ties that bind us. Chan has written a modern literary classic. <coughs> hmm. My tea this morning is chamomile because my throat's being weird and it's really soothing. Mm, I just have some regular chamomile tea. That's the School for Good Mothers. Okay, so if you want any of these four books, fill out the form, uh, pick which book you're most interested in, and also if you see anything in the leftovers that you want, go ahead and click on a couple of those, and I will give out, I will inform the winners tomorrow afternoon and start sending them out around that time. Okay. So, since I appear to have gotten my feet under me, and I'm not babbling like a crazy person, although, you know, maybe that's what you come for. I don't know. Uh, let's go ahead and look at our slides and talk about, most importantly, who won best of 2021? Let's get this, let's make it bigger. There we go. It's bigger. Okay. For Tia Number Tuesday. So there were two, the list of possible best of 2021. For fiction, I chose about a half dozen of the most checked out books here at Mobile Public Library, and another half a dozen or so of some of the best reviewed books of the year. The most best, almost hands down, best reviewed book of the year is Colson Whitehead's Harlem Shuffle. So I thought that was a very strong candidate. The most checked out book of the year was Kristen Hanna's The Four Winds, which a lot of people really enjoyed. And it got about 260 checkouts. I think it only beats the one next to it by 10 though. And then in a surprise upset, the winner for best of the year fiction is TJ Clunes Under the Whispering Door. I didn't even get 50% of the vote because the vote was split all over the place. But the Goodreads Choice Awards, which is the Goodreads users voting on what the best books of the year are, uh, this got the second place for fantasy. So if you're uh, interested in TJ Klune's the Under the Whispering Door, a lot of people really enjoyed it. And we have many copies. The winner for nonfiction was less of a surprise. <laughs> And exactly as it should be, it was Mobile's por Porch Parade, the oldest carnival in America celebrated in a new style. All right, thank you to everyone who participated. That was fun to put together and I'm glad you guys enjoyed it, hopefully. But let's go ahead and move on to this week's science fiction, fantasy and horror, starting with some fantasy, <laughs> science fiction, I don't know. You, you tell me what you think. All right, Battle of the Linguist Mages by Scott o. Moore. Isabel is the queen of the medieval rave themed VR game, Sparkle Dungeon. Her prowess in the game makes her an ideal candidate to learn the secrets of power morphemes, unnaturally dense units of meaning that warp perception when skillfully pronounced. But Isabel's reputation makes her the tar target of a strange resistance movement led by spell-casting anarchists, who may be the only thing stopping the cabal from toppling California over the edge of a terrible transformation with 40 million lives at stake. 
Time is short for Isabel to level up and choose a side because the cabal has attracted much bigger and weirder enemies than the anarchist resistance emerging from the dark and victorious and vicious dimensions of reality and heading straight for planet Earth. This got a starred review from Kirkus Magazine. If you're interested in the Battle of the Linguist Mages, it comes out January 1st. Okay. I don't know when we're going to hit this, but I know from practicing that there's a bunch of books towards the end of this list with one unpronounceable name after another, which is why it was on my mind that one of, uh, one of my colleagues enjoyed that the most. I'm like, Meredith is really gonna like this one because <laughs> I can't pronounce anything. I think this one's okay. This is Starless Crown by James Rollins. A gifted student foretells an apocalypse. Her reward is a sentence of death. Fleeing into the unknown, she is drawn into a team of outcasts. A broken soldier who once again takes up the weapons he's forbidden to wield and carves a trail back home. A drunken prince who steps out of his beloved brother's shadow and claims a purpose of his own. An imprisoned thief who escapes the crushing dark and discovers a gleaming artifact, one that will ignite a power struggle across the globe. On the run, hunted by enemies old and new, they must learn to trust each other in order to survive in a world evolved in strange, beautiful, and deadly ways and uncover ancient secrets that hold the key to their salvation. But with each passing moment, doom draws closer. Who will claim the starless crown? I believe this is gonna be the first in a series and it has uh, the endorsement of Terry Brooks according to the cover. But if you're interested in the starless crown, it comes out January 4th. Okay. All right, I think I'm pronouncing this name correctly. I'm probably wrong, but <laughs> The Daughter of the Moon Goddess by Su Lin Tan, all of that was fine. It's the main character's name that I'm concerned about. It's spelled Z-I-N-G-Y-I-N. So I've been pronouncing it as Zinjin, maybe? Okay, growing up on the moon, Zinjin is accustomed to solitude unaware that she is being hidden from the feared celestial emperor who exiled her mother for stealing his elixir of immortality. But when Zinjin's magic flares and her existence is discovered, she is forced to flee her home, leaving her mother behind. Alone, powerless, and afraid, she makes her way to the celestial kingdom, a land of wonder and secrets. Disguising her identity, she seizes an opportunity to learn alongside the emperor's son, mastering archery and magic even as passion flames between her and the prince. To save her mother, Zinjin embarks on a perilous quest, confronting legendary creatures and vicious enemies across the earth and skies. But when treachery looms and forbidden magic threatens the kingdom, she must challenge the ruthless celestial emperor for her dream, striking a dangerous bargain in which she is torn between losing all she loves and plunging the realm into chaos. Daughter of the Moon Goddess begins an enchanting romantic duology which weaves ancient Chinese mythology into a sweeping adventure of immortals and magic where love vies with honor, dreams are fraught with betrayal and hope emerges triumphant. So if you're interested in the Daughter of the Moon Goddess, it comes out January 11th. Okay. Such a Pretty Smile by Christy Demester. Demester. Demeester? Okay, one of those. Anyway, there's something out there that's killing, known as the Kerr. This is spelled C-U-R. He leaves no trace, save for the torn bodies of girls on the verge of becoming women who are known as troublemakers, those who refuse to conform to know their place, girls who don't know when to shut up. 2019, 13-year-old Lila Sawyer has secrets she can't share with anyone, not the school psychologist she's seen, not her father who has a new wife and a new baby, and not her mother, the infamous Caroline Sawyer, a unique artist whose eerie sculptures made from bent twigs and crumbled leaves have made her a local celebrity. But when Lila feels haunted from within, terrorized by a delicious evil that shows her how to find her voice until she's punished for using it. 2004, Caroline Sawyer hears dogs everywhere, snarling, barking teeth, snapping that no one else seems to notice. 
At first, she blames the phantom sounds on her insomnia and her acute stress in caring for her ailing father. But then the delusions begin to take shape, both in her waking hours and in the violent visceral sculptures she creates while in a trance-like state. Her fiancé is convinced she needs help. Her new psychiatrist waves her problem away with pills. But Caroline's past is a dark cellar filled with repressed memories and a lurking horror that the men around her can't understand. As past demons become a present threat, both Caroline and Lila must chase the source of this unrelenting oppressive power to its malignant core. Brilliantly paced, unsettling to the bone, and unapologetically fierce, such a pretty smile is a powerful allegory for what it means to be a woman, and an untamed rallying cry for anyone ever told to sit down, shut up, and smile pretty. If you're interested in such a pretty smile, it comes out January 18th. All right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think we're in the scary names. We're into the scary names. All right. This is How High We Go in the Dark by, I think, Sequoia Nagamatsu. Maybe. Story begins in 2030. A grieving archaeologist arrives in the Arctic Circle to continue the work of his deceased daughter at the, this is probably the name of a real crater, uh, Batagaika, Batagaika Crater, where researchers are studying long buried secrets now revealed in melting permafrost, including the perfectly preserved remains of a girl who appears to have died of an ancient virus. Once unleashed, the Arctic plague will reshape life on Earth for generations to come quickly traversing the globe, forcing humanity to devise a myriad of moving and inventive ways to embrace possibility in the face of tragedy. In a theme park designed for the terminally ill children, a cynical employee falls in love with a mother desperate to hold on to her infected son. A heartbroken scientist searching for a cure finds a second chance of fatherhood when one of his test subjects, a pig, develops the capacity for human speech. A widowed painter and her teenage granddaughter embark on a cosmic quest to locate a new home planet. From funerary skyscrapers to hotels for the dead to inter interstellar starships, Sequoia Nagamatsu takes readers on a wildly original and compassionate journey spanning continents, centuries, and even celestial bodies to tell a story about the resiliency of the human spirit, our infinite capacity to dream, and the connective threads that tie us all together in the universe. All right. If you were interested in how high we go in the dark, it comes out January 18th. All right. Okay. I think I can do these names, but we shall see. Engines of Empire by R.S. Ford. The nation of Torwin is run on the power of industry, and the industry is run by the guilds. Chief among them are the Hawkspurs, and their responsibility is to keep the gears of the empire turning. It's exactly why matriarch Rosamond Hawkspur sends each of her heirs to the far reaches of the nation. Kanal, the eldest son, is sent to the distant frontier to earn his stripes in the military. It is here that he faces a threat he never saw coming, the first rumblings of revolution. Tyretta? Tyretta's sorceress connection to the magical resource of Pyrostone that fuels the Empire's machines makes her the perfect heir in theory. While Tyretta hopes that she might shirk her responsibilities during the journey to one of Torwin's most important Pyrostone mines, she instead finds the dark horrors of industry that the Empire would prefer to keep hidden. The youngest, Fulren, is a talented artificer. Artifice, artifice, art. It's got to be Artificer, right? Anyway, and finds himself acting as consort to a foreign emissary. Soon after, he is framed for a crime he never committed, a crime that could start a war. As each of the Hawkspurs gamble, grapple with the many threats that face the nation within and without, they must finally prove themselves wor worthy or the empire will fall apart. This got a starred review from Kirkus. If you're interested in Engines of Empire, it comes out January 18th. All right. Devil House by John Darnell. Gage Chandler is descended from kings. That's what his mother always told him. 
Now he is a true crime writer, with one grisly success and a movie adaptation to his name, along with a series of subsequent le lesser efforts to have paid the bills, but not much more. But now he is being offered a huge opportunity to move into the house that the locals call the Devil House. It was the site of a briefly notorious pair of murders. He begins his research with diligence and enthusiasm, but soon the story leads him into a puzzle he never expected, back into his own work and what it means, back to the very core of what he does and who he is. This got a star review from Publishers Weekly. If you're interested in Devil House, it comes out January 25th. Okay. So this is one that gets really rough because it's a lot of very real world names and they're real world names in Russia. So this first paragraph is about a thing that genuinely exists. And then we get into the fiction once we start talking about the main character. K-O-L-Y-M-A. Kolyma Highway, otherwise known as the Road of Bones, is a 1200 mile stretch of Siberian road where winter temperatures can drop as low as 60 degrees below zero. Under Stalin, at least 80 Soviet gulags were built along the route to supply the USSR with a readily available workforce. And over time, hundreds of thousands of prisoners died in the midst of their labors. Their bodies were buried where they fell, plowed under the permafrost underneath the road. So that's true, that's, that's all exists. Felix Tiegland, or Teig, is a documentary producer. And when he learns about the Road of Bones, he realizes he stumbled onto untapped potential. Accompanied by his camera operator, Teague hires a local Yukat guide to, tell, to take them to Oy Mai Akon, spelled O-Y-M-Y-A-K-O-N. There's gotta be a better pronunciation for that. Anyway. Uimaya Khan, the coldest settlement on earth. Teague is fascinated by the culture along the Road of Bones and encounters strange characters on the way to Uimaya Khan. But when the team arrives, they find the village mysteriously abandoned apart from a nine-year-old girl. Then chaos ensues. A malignant animalistic shaman and the forest spirits he commands pursues them as they flee the abandoned town and barrel across miles of deserted permafrost. As the chase continues along the road, paved with suffering and angry ghosts, what form will the echoes of their anguish take? Teague and the others will have to find the answers if they want to survive the road of bones. I bet that's very interesting. And it's got a Stephen King quote on the cover. So clearly, horror. Is this another... No, I think I can pronounce these names. <laughs> Light Years From Home by Mike, Mike Chen. Okay. Every family has its issues, but every family can't blame them on extraterrestrials. Evie, Xiao, and her sister Cass aren't on speaking terms. 15 years ago on a family camping trip, their father and brother vanished. Their dad turned up days later, dehydrated and confused, and convinced he'd been abducted by aliens. Their brother Jacob remained missing. The women dealt with it very differently. Cass became the rock of the family. Evie traded academics to pursue alien conspiracy theories, always looking for, for Jacob. When Evie's UFO network uncovers a new event, she goes to investigate and discovers Jacob is back. He's different, older, stranger, and talking of an intergalactic war. But the tensions between the siblings haven't changed at all. If the family is going to come together to help Jacob, then Cass and Evie are going to have to fix their issues, and fast. Because the FBI is after Jacob, and if their brother is telling the truth, possibly an entire space armada too. The perfect combination of action, imagination, and heart, Light Years From Home is a touching drama about a challenge as difficult as saving the galaxy. Making peace with your family and yourself. This got a starred review from Library Journal. If you are interested in Light Years from Home, it comes out January 25th. All right, our final book of today, and effectively our final book of 2021. So, Hold My Place by 
Cassandra Windwalker. Okay. When librarian Sigrun, spelled S-I-G-R-U-N, falls head over heels for the sophisticated and very mar married Edgar Leeward, she never expects to find herself in his bed or his heart. Nevertheless, when his enigmatic wife Octavia dies from a sudden illness, Sigrun finds herself caught up in a whirlwind romance worthy of the most lurid novels on her bookshelves. Sigrun soon discovers Octavia wasn't Edgar's first lost love or even his second. Three women Edgar has loved met early deaths. As she delves into her beloved's past through a trove of discovered letters, the edges of Sigrun's identity begin to disappear, fading into the women of the past. Sigrun tells herself it's impossible for any dark magic to be at play, that the dead can't possibly inhabit the bodies of the living, but something shadowy stalks the halls of the Layward house, and the lines between the love of the present and the obsessions of the past became increasingly blurred and bloody. If you are interested in Hold My Place, it comes back, comes out January 25th. All right. That is it for me today and for 2021. I will be back on January 4th with February's um, hits, like, you know, the hot titles of February. Don't forget to enter the giveaway. I will add the link to the comments as soon as I log off here. And you can also join our Goodreads group if you like. We've got all of our books in there. Or you can sign up for the Teen New Book Tuesday newsletter, which also contains all the books I'm going to discuss today. So I will see you guys in two weeks when we talk about February's hits. All right. Bye.